Thank you for tuning in to the Movie Geeks United 35th Anniversary Celebration of Martin Scorsese's Raging Bull. Thanks to our sister show, Back by Midnight, and its host, Arenada Diaz, tonight we bring you two spectacular interviews related to the film. First up, legendary cinematographer Michael Chapman, whose stark and beautiful black-and-white photography in Raging Bull makes it one of the landmark films of that decade. Plus, director William Lustig, you might know him as the man behind the acclaimed cult horror film Maniac, but you might not know that he is the nephew of the subject of Raging Bull, boxer Jake LaMotta. In December of 1980, Martin Scorsese's Raging Bull was released at a moment when things were both ending and beginning. Film historians have used the film's release as a kind of line of demarcation for the end of the so-called last golden era of American cinema. Ostensibly a biopic of the Bronx Bull Jake LaMotta, Raging Bull is not so much a death knell for an era, but the beginning of a new act in the career of America's greatest living filmmaker. From Robert De Niro's astonishing transformation into Jake LaMotta, to the moving portrait of a brother's love for his self-destructive older brother, to the vivid black and white photography, to the examination of jealousy, to the exhausting recreation of the famous boxing matches with Sugar Ray Robinson, Raging Bull is more than a counter-argument for the excess of Michael Cimino's Heaven's Gate. Seen today, Raging Bull is a timeless film about a man who falls from grace only to pick himself back up. It is in Jake LaMotta's willingness to go on that we are able to not only see his humanity, but see ourselves as we all struggle to carry on. Tonight, we are joined by two men who saw how it all went down. Our first guest is one of the most innovative cinematographers of the last 40 years. Starting out as a camera operator on such landmark 70s films like Clute, Little Murders, and The Godfather, Michael Chapman made his debut as a cinematographer on the Hal Ashby Road comedy The Last Detail. Since then, he's only worked with the best. He not only collaborates with veteran filmmakers like Philip Kaufman and Ivan Reitman, but takes chances on screenwriters making their transitions and directing, like James Toback with the Gonzo character study Fingers, or Robert Towns' Olympic love story, Personal Best. Other highlights include the sci-fi horror comedy update of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the American Graffiti meets Mean Street's coming-of-age comedy, The Wanderers, the Matt signed as parody, The Man with Two Brains, the teen vampire horror comedy, The Last, the Lost Boys. The only in New York nightmare comedy, Quick Change. The brooding courtroom thriller, Primal Fear. The elegant Hitchcockian action thriller, The Fugitive, which garnered Chapman a well-deserved Oscar nomination. And most recently, the delicate adaptation of the children's classic, Bridge to Terabithia. His collaboration with Martin Scorsese, began with the urban war hallmark Taxi Driver, where Chapman made the ugliness of the filth, scum, rain, and steam of New York City into something beautiful. He would follow this up with the intimate concert film The Last Waltz. Then came Raging Bull, with its emphasis on tabloid photography and newsreel immediacy. The use of black and white photography in Raging Bull wasn't groundbreaking because no one else had done it, but because it hadn't been done in this particular way. It owed more to movies like The Setup and Body and Soul than it did Rocky. The in-the-ring boxing matches, with their smoke, sweat, disorientation, and blinding camera flashes, remain the gold standard in boxing sequences. Then there are the scenes of Jake LaMotta's home life, that play like a mix of slapstick, screwball comedy, and domestic violence. Or there are the scenes of Kathy Moriarty's Vicky lounging by the pool, 
her legs appearing and disappearing in the water. Michael Chapman's camera captures every detail in what still remains the best film of the 1980s. Joining us to discuss this and his other achievements as a cinematographer and filmmaker, it is my pleasure to welcome Michael Chapman to Back by Midnight. Do I say something now? I don't know. Go ahead. No, no, hello. Uh, Who's the other person you're interviewing? Uh, Jake, uh, I mean, uh, uh, William Lustig will be on later on tonight. I see, okay. Bill Lustig will be on to talk about uh, his uncle Jake. Um, Right. Well, before we get into Raging Bull and all and uh, all that went into it, uh, how did you get into uh, being a, a cameraman slash cinematography? How did you how did you get into that? Oh, and, uh, it, entirely just by accident. I, I it was so long ago that there were not film schools and everything. Uh, I, I just really really just stumbled into it. Um, <laughs> I, I married the daughter of a, a French emigre cameraman in New York named Joe Brun who uh, uh, didn't really think his daughter should be married to a freight brakeman on the Erie Lackawanna Railroad, um, <clears throat> who was aspiring to be God knows what in the art world in New York. Uh, so he, uh, you know, since I, <laughs> I had to uh, earn some money to support a wife and family, uh, got me into the movie business, loading magazines and starting out as a, as a um, second assistant cameraman, and I just stumbled along from there. Yeah. Uh, one of your... So, am I right in some of your early credits? I mean, I, I believe one of your earliest credits is uh, is Husbands, the the cast. Of oh, I was an operator on Husbands. I, you know, I bummed around was an operator on bits and pieces. I was only an operator on, I think, roughly half of Husbands. The original operator uh, left. He was fired. He left. He had. He got sick. I have no memory. It's many, many years ago. Yeah, I, I worked on it for maybe three weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess something like you know it's a long, long time ago, so I'm a little shaky. But yeah, I worked on husbands. I worked on all sorts of things. Well, I'm curious uh, about your camera operator on on Clute, which was uh, the, the the cinematographer was Gordon Willis. Yeah, well, I was Gordy's. Uh, I was Gordy's operator. Mm-hmm. He the first movie that he shot was the first movie that I operated. He asked me to be his operator on a movie that he was going. You know, he, he got a chance to um, to light a movie. Mm-hmm. And he asked me if I wanted to come an operator, and of course I, you know, knowing nothing about operating, I jumped at the chance and said yes, and uh, it all went on from there. I got I got carried along by Gordy as he as he transformed cinematography. You know? Right, and, uh, uh, and I just it, it was again it was like uh, Joe Brunton getting me into the movies in the first place. It was a matter of being in the right place at the right time, and then hopefully doing a decent job when you give right. it. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm assuming from Clute operating the camera on Clute that that led into uh, operating on a. Uh, on Godfather. Well, it, I operated all of them. I mean, mm-hmm. all of his movies for about six years. Mm-hmm. I operated them all. Godfather, and I forget what the last one was. A uh, couple right. of, you know, then then uh, then Gordy got his. In that at that time, the unions were divided between a New York union and a California union. And sometime after Godfather won, again, I, I the, the precise things were a little shaky. It was thirty five, forty years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he got a card in the West Coast, mm-hmm. and so I w- and I didn't have one, and so I was uh, suddenly on my own, and I operated. I operated Jaws, for instance. Uh, I was the operator on the original Jaws, which was not with Gordy. But then mm-hmm. I, uh, you know, I had to make a living, and, mm-hmm. and I got a chance to light, and so I did. And uh, and if you just join us, we're talking to cinematographer Michael Chapman. Uh, cinematographer on many films that we're covering, uh, but ostensibly Raking Bull, which is now out on Blu-ray. Uh, well, how did you get the, the opportunity for your first uh, gig as a cinematographer, which was The Last Detail? Um, about? Yes. Uh, um, Hal Ashby had made a movie in New York several years before called uh, The Landlord, right. which Gordy had lit and I had operated. And so he knew me, and he was going to come back to the East Coast Again, this is in large part about union jurisdiction. He was going to go back to the East Coast to make uh, uh, Last Detail, and he and he wanted Gordy to do it, but Gordy couldn't because he mm-hmm. was by then he had his card on the West Coast, and he was committed to God knows what I can't remember. And so Gordy very sweetly said, "Why don't you use Chappie?" And he knew me from uh, uh, Hal knew me from uh, Last uh, from the Landlord, and um, he offered me the job. <laughs> I had a, I had the one thing that he above all needed. I had a card in the East Coast Union. Um, so he offered me the job, and of course I jumped at it. 
That's great. Took it. and, it's a marvelous movie, a lot of detail. I don't know if people see it much anymore. I'm not talking about my cinematography, which is <laughs> which, which is primitive beyond belief, but it's a marvelous movie. Jack yes, Nicholson. it is. It's, I, I mean, it's still a, it's still a great uh, oh, great profane comedy. Oh yeah, I am. Well, I won't, can't say it on radio. I guess I am. Oh, yes, you can. You know what? It is a marvelous movie. Yeah, and I and I of course was just thrilled to be able to. You know, to be a DP, and then again, I staggered on from there. Well, and around that time, I, I guess, uh, I guess it was in California. I'm assuming that that's when you met uh, Philip Kaufman. No, it wasn't in California. Phil uh, was doing again. This is in part uh, because of union jurisdiction. Phil was doing a movie in the Arctic called White Dawn right. uh, about Eskimos. Oh, you, you can't don't say Eskimos anymore. But anyway. Uh, and he had originally hired a a Canadian cameraman, and they went to uh, up into the Arctic to do some camera tests and things. And they, unfortunately, the guy <laughs> shot some film, and when Phil looked at it, he freaked, and he didn't know what to do. But the people back in L.A. had said, "Oh, look, there's this young guy uh, in New York who shot Last Detail, and he's wants to use him." And so he called me up. I didn't know him from, I mean, I knew the name, but I didn't know anything about him. He called me up, and I said, sure. It was a movie in the Arctic. I had, for reasons too complicated to go into, I had lived in the Arctic for a year before, <laughs> a longer time before that. So I, I, and I loved the Arctic, and I jumped at the chance of going there. So we, uh, we that's how I did White Dawn. I just, you know, again, well, in the right place I'm, at the right time. I'm curious about, about White Dawn because it is such a uh, very physically, you know, I'm sure demanding. Oh, yes. What was okay. what was the uh, <laughs> what was the most I guess difficult? Uh, you know, every day was difficult. I I can't even remember. Every day was difficult. I mean, the really? uh, the dogs ran away with the cameras on, on a sled, you know, and also everything. And, and you name it, it had happened. Um, it was it was enormously demanding, but it was also uh, fascinating, you know, because <laughs> I don't know again if the people in the audience who are listening to this have seen it. I recommend it highly. It's a marvelous movie. Right. Uh, um, we were filming a, a way of life that was disappearing before our eyes, you know. Of the the you know, we, the younger kids had to ask their parents uh, how to do certain things because they no longer know how to do them. The mm -hmm. traditional uh, Inuit things, uh, and uh, it was a world that was disappearing very very rapidly. Mm -hmm. And so it was, you know, it was fascinating to see. And although it was hideously difficult, right. uh, we were trying to make a sort of Hollywood movie with a generator pulled on a sled, pulled by dogs and things. Uh, it, it was, it was fascinating. It was absolutely mm -hmm. fascinating and, and wonderful, wonderful fun. Well, and well, all sorts of crazy things happened. Everything which I won't go into. But I mean, you know, <laughs> I'm not. I'm just don't want to bore you with. Detailed. No, no. Uh, every story. Is anyway, it was it was it was a it was a wonderful experience. It was extremely mm. difficult, as you can imagine. Right. But um, uh, we did it, and I'm very proud of it. It's uh, mm. it it really does capture a way of life that just just about doesn't exist then. Mm. Almost didn't exist, and certainly doesn't now. Right. And it's well worth seeing. Yes, yes, it is. It's a terrific film. And before we get to Scorsese, I, I got to ask about one of my all-time favorite films. Uh, that, that's also a Philip Kaufman film, and that's that's The Wanderers. Oh, isn't the wonder is fun? Yeah, uh, it's, it's remarkable, and uh, I'm 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 curious about the uh, the camera work on that one because uh, I'm guessing that it was kind of a, a rather low budget film. Oh, it was, and, yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of uh, I guess I mean I guess a lot of uh, handheld, a lot of stuff on the street. There's a early mm. on there's a great foot chase, and the camera is really running with them. Um, yeah, you know I you know I I I. I can't remember any any specifically innovative things we did. I, I operated a lot of it myself, although I was by then a DP because I was um, I at least thought of myself as a really good operator, and operating is great fun, wonderful mm -hmm. fun. And so we just we kind of did it. We you know uh, Phil and I had seen a lot of Jean Luc Godard, and and God knows it's full of Godard, and a lot of that is shooting in the streets. You know, when you right. think of Breathless and those things, it's, it's, they went out on the streets of Paris and shot, and we went out in the streets of the Bronx. And shot with however we could, handheld or or uh, on a dolly or whatever, mm -hmm. you know whatever we could get away with, we did. Right. And uh, we did really live in the streets and things, in a, in a, I think a quite successful way. It's a marvelous movie. Still, right. still somewhat underestimated among the the 70s directors. You know, he he's not ironical. He's he's very very kind to his characters. I mean, ironic yeah. things may happen to them, but. He treats them with enormous kindness, and that's and uh, um, wonders is full of that. 
I'm, yes. I'm very proud of it, but it's very, very much Phil's movie, not mine. I, mean, I, yeah. I just did what I could to help him out. And uh, what was, and I guess the year before y'all had done Body Snatchers and what was no what no was that no like? Body Snatchers the first one is oh, wait a minute wait a minute the first the one's White Dawn uh, and then is, I can't remember is is, uh, is Body Snatchers before Wanderers or after I have no it's, memory it's before 1978 it is? oh yeah okay all right and so that's your first sci-fi film you're dealing with special effects yeah what, yeah what was that like oh I didn't do the special effects you know we just <laughs> shot the, the, those sort of fake pods and they did a lot of that stuff later and they did, well actually they did some of them we one of them we had a little midget who <laughs> came out of a pod an actual midget dressed all you know dressed up in green glop and everything and he came out as i'd forgotten that but uh, there weren't enormous amounts of uh, special effects in it there were there were, there were <laughs> the pods but other than that there wasn't much it was fun though it's not, it's a, it, it was a lot of fun to do and we kind of you know it doesn't have the the enormous kind of uh, zeitgeist that the original uh, um, mm-hmm. Invasion of the Body Snatchers has, the Mac- McCarthy era and things like that. Right. But it, 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 we had a lot of fun doing it, and, mm-hmm. and hopefully we were uh, uh, more or less fair to the original ones. We had a lot, a lot of fun doing it. It was great right. to do. Uh, if you just join us, we're talking to cinematographer Michael Chapman. We're talking about a lot of things, but we're, this is on the occasion of the Blu-ray debut of Raging Bull. So I guess, let's, let's get to Martin Scorsese, and, uh, New York filmmaker, uh, uh, so was this a case, your first collaboration was Taxi Driver, was this a case of New York Union needed a New York cinematographer? Were well, uh, yeah, he needed a, a, you know, it was a Union movie, and it was being mm-hmm. done in New York, and it was, uh, people probably forget now, but it was in, it was a low-budget movie, you know, none, mm-hmm. of, none of the people involved were the huge superstars they became later, so it, um, it was quite a low-budget movie, and he needed uh, a cameraman in New York who had to be union cameraman and I, he interviewed a lot of people and someone who knew me recommended me and he interviewed me and we talked and he saw I guess he I, I'm sure he looked at uh, last detail and things um, and we talked and we both had uh, as I say drunk a whole lot of Godard and we also talked tended to talk very fast and so he would talk fast and I would talk fast and he hired me I don't know you'd have to ask Marty why he hired me I was just very grateful he did mm-hmm and uh, so, what, what was that like? I mean, I'm, I'm a this majority of uh, night shoots, if uh, I'm guessing. Uh, well, it was it was. Um, it well, was, here, let me let me ask you this. And please, you know, Taxi Driver. You know, every, everyone always remembers kind of the 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 grime of, of the of the streets, the the mm-hmm. rain, the steam, the the filth, and all that Travis has seen. How much of that was just uh, turning on the camera and just filming, you know, what was there, or and how much of that was having to heighten and add uh, to give it the atmosphere? Um, you know, I'd say it's about 50-50, something vaguely like that. Some of the things that people remember were setups, like the very beginning where the taxi drives over uh, the steam hole and the steam comes up and everything, and it, you know, reminds people of the end, of the, sort of the gates of hell or something. That steam was that we, we, we rigged that up. Mm-hmm. And various other things. Uh, some at one time, Travis is driving, and uh, some kids throw some, you know, eggs and stuff at him, and, he, and they and they turn on a fire hydrant and it sprays. Well, you know, we set those things up. But a lot of it is just the city at night. We didn't have much money, mm-hmm. so we couldn't really light uh, the night of New York. We had to just go there and sort of whatever, swim like a fish in the sea of the people. We had no choice. It was mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of uh, what passes for aesthetics in movies is really. Uh, the result of mechanical uh, mm-hmm. limitations. So we had to go and, and um, shoot in the streets with the available light and things. And so it, that look of New York is, that's what New York looked like. That's just the exposure I could get in the middle of the night. Right, right. When, and uh, y'all seem to work well because then you shot uh, his short, uh, American Boy. Uh, yes. Yeah. God, you've seen that? I, I that, actually I I have not seen I I know some friends who have seen it but I do know of its existence. Uh, yeah, that that's one of those. Some people admit to rather peculiar things in that movie, so I'm not sure that it. <laughs> I don't know. It's a very it's a very odd little movie. Right. Uh, <laughs> but yes, I did that, and then and then I did you know I, in what order I now can't remember. I did then you last do, then, and, then and, you do the last waltz. Uh, the last the last waltz come before um, Raging Bull. I guess it does. Yes. It does, yeah. Okay, yeah, I did that, and then then I did Raging Bull. Yeah. Well, uh, before before we get to Raging Bull, finally, uh, tell tell me about the Last Waltz because here is a a concert film, probably the first concert film uh, ever to be actually 
you know, at the very least, quote unquote, you know, to a certain extent, storyboarded and planned oh, out. Oh, heavily storyboarded, heavily, heavily storyboarded. Well, the real, the, I think, the thing about Last Waltz is that Marty had worked on, uh, you know, what do you call it, uh, the original rock and roll concert movie in Upstate. Woodstock. You know? Woodstock. Woodstock. Yeah. He'd worked on Woodstock. He'd been one of the editors. He'd won. I think he'd shot some of it. He'd been all involved in it, and he very much wanted to do his own uh, concert movie. Mm-hmm. And he knew Robbie, and, and it kind of evolved. Originally, they were just going to kind of do a 16 millimeter little documentary of their last appearance, and then it evolved and evolved and evolved, and it ended up with like what nine or ten cameras and all 35 millimeter and a huge production. Uh, but yes, it, the, it was enormously storyboarded. Um, every song that the band played was storyboarded. Every verse and every chorus was storyboarded. What the, what each camera would do. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the songs of the other. People, the guests, we couldn't storyboard because we didn't know quite what they were going to play, and we didn't, we know, we weren't as familiar with the music sometimes. But all of the band songs are absolutely uh, storyboarded to within an inch of their life, and and each camera had a, a set of storyboards and a and a page turner, like somebody who paid, turns the pages for a mm-hmm. concert pianist. And they would, you know, they say, okay, now you zoom in, now you do this, and then they would turn the page, and now it says you do this at this point, and every camera was was uh, choreographed to within mm-hmm. an inch of its life. Ninety percent by Marty and maybe ten percent by me, because I, by accident, I happened to know all the band songs. Uh, I, I was a great admirer of the band. Right. As Marty was, so yes, it, it's enormously, um, you know, planned and and programmed, and, and I think very successfully. Well, I'm curious about uh, the one sequence that isn't from the concert, and that's I guess the Amy Lou Harris uh, song. That oh yeah, there actually there are several that aren't. There's Amy Lou Harris, and then there's the Pointer Sisters. And then someone else. Staples, Staples sisters, and and so oh, how, sisters. And how sisters were, else, but yes. were those were those storyboarded or were those more? Oh yeah, they were storyboarded, but they were done. At, you see, we shot the concert. Mm-hmm. It was roughly edited. It was given to, shown to, whatever studio put it up. I can't remember now. UA. Uh, and they and they said, okay, do some. They gave them more money to shoot uh, some other sequences, which uh, were done on the stages at what was, what was then MGM and is now Sony. Uh, and that was Amy Lou Harris and the, the what Staples did I say, the Staples Sisters. Yes, yeah. and something else too. I forget what. Uh, anyway, they were done. Uh, they were done very, very elaborately uh, on a stage with mm-hmm. dollies and things. All the sort of moving cameras that we couldn't u- do in the in the concert in San Francisco. Uh, we did in those in those uh, in those staged songs. And then, of course, there's uh, a, going through it. There's a whole long set of interviews up at the, a, a place that the band owned uh, in Zuma Beach, up on mm-hmm. Malibu. We used to go every Saturday night for God knows how many months and, and, and uh, shoot on every Saturday night up there. So mm-hmm. there's a lot that isn't, that's beyond the actual concert. But right. that was because uh, UA, whoever it was, you said it was UA? Well, I, I believe you. They mm-hmm. realized that, they, you know, that it was going to be good, and so they put in some more money and allowed us to shoot more stuff. Wow. Uh, if you just join us, we're talking to cinematographer uh, Michael Chapman, and we're talking about basically going through his resume here, but uh, it's on the occasion of the Blu-ray debut of Raging Bull. So I guess we should finally get to Raging Bull. Uh, what what was that? Uh, did Marty come to you and says, "I want you to do this"? And uh, yeah, as I remember, we'd been. Uh, oh, that's right. He he had had he made another movie in the meantime. New mean, York, that, New York, was, New York, New York, and that was done. With West Coast people, and at that time I didn't have a card, so mm-hmm. he had uh, God, who did it? Not Joe Mosh. Laszlo Kovac did it. Uh, mm-hmm. And then when we were going to do Raging Bull, it was back in New York. And now why he asked me rather than Laszlo, you know, I don't even remember now. It's so mm-hmm. long ago. But I remember that we were going to do it, and we were both very excited about it. And then Marty called me up one day and he said, "What if we do it in black and white?" <laughs> And since again, since I knew absolutely nothing about black and white, I jumped at the chance and said, "Sure," because both to Marty and to me and to anybody of a, a certain age, uh, boxing is a black and white sport. You know, mm-hmm. they used to be on early television. There were the Friday night fights in black and white, and all of the famous stills of black and white from from uh, Life magazine and things like that are all in black and white. So it was very much a black and white sport. And and of course, the time at which it took place was a, a black and white world as far as visual reporting. So, uh, yeah, we jumped. We thought, I thought it was a wonderful idea to do black and white. Well, let's, and go we through some, let's go through some of these sequences. And I guess the first sequence I'll ask is the, uh, the famous title sequence. Oh, How did that uh, come about? 
You know, I, I don't remember. I think Marty had drew up storyboards, and that's how he wanted it. And uh, um, that it was, you know, it's somewhat abstract, obviously, and in slow motion. Uh, I again, I'm sorry not to have some sort of uh, no, sorry. Thing, but it's so long ago that I honestly don't remember. I know that it's Marty's idea, not mine. Right. Certainly, that the one thing I can remember, if you if you remember the sequence, there are occasionally flashes in the background as if somebody is taking a picture. Right. You know, people, as if people think, well, that's me wandering around with an old um, speed graphic camera with old old time flash bulbs, and I wrapped myself up in in black duvetine so I wouldn't show up at all. Only the flash would show, and I wandered around in the background of what I assumed would be the shot, you know, knowing what the lens was in the uh, direction the camera was aiming, and it, and it intervals I would uh, hopefully not <laughs> the same interval time at the time I would let loose flashes and anyway that's my con- contribution to uh, to that sequence all that in the lighting well and then uh, another sequence that everyone always talks about is uh, Jake and his brother leaving the uh, the locker room and then walking oh the yes when the, when the steady, in the wonderful steady cam shot isn't that marvelous yeah. uh, we had originally been going to do one of the fights in steady cam and uh, Steadicam had just come into play then, and the guy's name was, his name escapes me who invented it, Garrett, Garrett Brown. Yeah. We mm-hmm. brought Garrett Brown out uh, with his Steadicam to do one of the fights. One of the fights was going to be done in, in Steadicam. We had a different, uh, different approach for each fight. You know, one was going to be this, one was going to be that, and one was going to be Steadicam. And, but then we, when we started watching it, we just, it just didn't seem precise enough, so we didn't do it. We, we canceled it, and we did something else for that fight, and we sent poor Garrett Brown home. But we did do that one shot of, of him walking all the way through and up the stairs and down the stairs and into the ring, and then the guy of the steady cam, as he gets into the ring, the guy in the steady cam steps into a big crane, and the crane rises the camera up. About, that's a wonderful shot. It's a wonderful shot. Well, I got, so I'll ask the inevitable question. How many takes was that you know, roughly? Uh, I think no more than three at the most. Really? Yeah. Well, you got to remember, it was a lot of people to get herded back into position and everything. We didn't do it many times. Once we knew we had it, there's no particular sense in doing it. You know, I mean, we, we and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was four, but it, it was not a lot of takes. It really wasn't. There were a couple of busted takes where somebody looked in the camera or something, but right. full takes. I can't think that, that there were more than three, or maybe four. Right. And so I guess let, well, let's talk a little about these boxing matches. And I've heard Scorsese mention that each one had kind of dif- different visual tricks that uh, to kind of differentiate them, um, I guess. But uh, so was that always, uh, was that just a collaboration of like both you and him throwing out ideas? I remember, I guess, uh, one take, one, one boxing match, the ring was enlarged. Uh, to be yes, one more. of them that was, was made bigger and, and, and kind of in disproportionate ways. Um, look, I, there, there are various Every once in a while, I see something that says, you know, that Chapman did this. I think, what's it called? Wikipedia. Right. Uh, and I looked at it and it said that he, Chapman was wonderful at improvising setups and this and that. Mm-hmm. For instance, the boxing and raging. Well, I want to just please let everyone understand the boxing. The arrangement of the boxing sequences in Raging Well, that's Marty Scorsese. That's not me. I wish it were me, but please, I don't in any sense want to take credit for that. I did, uh, I hope, a good job in fulfilling what Marty wanted, but the basic impulse and the basic impulse for each fight, this one's going to be long lens, this one's going to be handheld, this one's going to be with a distorted ring. These come from Marty, not from me. Well, would that they did come from me, but I don't I want anyone to believe that I'm trying to say they did. Right. Well, let's talk a little, uh, some of the other things. Uh, there's other little techniques done, and I'm curious if they're in the camera or post-production. I guess one of the, the things that's done a, couple, a few times throughout the film is to accentuate Jake's jealousy um, is the slow motion. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Oh, listen. Yeah. You know, the slow motion, uh, there's a lot of slow motion in the fighting, but it's never in the fighting. Mm-hmm. It's all, all, actually, it is towards the very end when Jake, uh, when uh, um, uh, Sugar Ray you know, almost executes him, there's some slow motion. But basically, the actual fighting, we decided should always be 24 frames. Mm-hmm. And sometimes when, be, uh, and sometimes in between rounds and things like that, it can be slow motion. There's a famous shot that begins in 24 frames where he knocks one of the guys over, and then he has to retreat to a, retreat to a neutral corner. And as he retreats, the camera goes to 48 frames. Hmm. And then when he's, as he comes back into fighting again, it goes back to 24 frames right. by the time he actually fights again. But 
But the actual fighting, I think, except for, the, as I say, the very end where Sugar Ray almost mm-hmm. executes him, uh, all of the fighting is 24. Mm-hmm. In between p- times, like when he's, there's a shot of him uh, kind of semi-comatose in a corner where they pour water over him and it rolls down over his body and it's at like 120 frames. Right. It's like the Mantegnan deposition of Christ. And that, those and other things are done as stylistic mm-hmm. stuff, but the fights themselves are 24. Mm-hmm. And, the fight, and, by the way, the fights in, in Raging Bull, it's, it's useful to think of the fights as kind of arias, and that Raging Bull is a sort of opera. Mm-hmm. It's a kind of, uh, there's a late form of Italian opera called the Rismo Opera, which is about real people and ordinary events instead of kings and queens and things. And the most obvious examples are Cavalleria Rusticana, which, by the way, you were playing on track music from Cavalleria Rusticana when I was listening. Right. That and, and uh, um, Pagliacci are the most famous of the Verismo operas. Well, Raging Bull is a kind of Verismo opera. It's the same people, you know, uh, um, from southern Italy, except they're in the Bronx. And mm-hmm. they don't sing, they fight. But those, <laughs> those fight sequences are designed as big production numbers, almost as if it was a musical or an opera. Think of them as arias, you know. Again, well, and this, then, this is Marty, not me, by the way. <laughs> Well, and then I guess the other, uh, I guess another, the famous image is Jake alone in his uh, his cell, and it's pitch black, and uh-huh. I guess we only see a little shaft of light that uh, kind of illuminates, I guess, his his, his face a little. Uh, well, sometimes, and, and sometimes yeah. he goes out of it, and then it's one of those examples where where not seeing it is almost as powerful as seeing it, you know, mm-hmm. because he's there. There's a shaft of light through the through the the, the window of the cell. There's one mm-hmm. chapter of light, and he plays, he somewhat almost plays with it, with the, uh, I mean, Bobby does, um, with being in and out of the light. Yeah, that, right. that, that's a really wonderful, heartbreaking sequence. Oh, God. Well, when the movie was, was done and it came out in at December of 1980, and it was unanimous critical acclaim, did you look at it as a, at the time, uh, as opposed to now, did you look at it as a, benchmark or did you look at it well that was good work and now i need to get on to my next job i or think you... i think inevitably you, you're bound to just say okay that's good now i'm going to go on to nothing to t- tell you the truth embarrassingly enough i thought we'd all done wonderful job you know the, the mm-hmm. acting and everything I, I thought i'd done a good job that we all had i didn't quite think the movie worked mm-hmm. and uh paul schrader didn't either who wrote the original script and and then i didn't see it for a long time um, to answer your question, yes, I thought, okay, I've done that, that's fine. It was black and white. It was, I've never done black and white. It turned out pretty well. Now I've got to get another job. I mean, that, that's what the movie business is like. We're all just migrant laborers, you know, <laughs> looking to uh, go. Oh, no, please, believe me, it's true. Uh, just going to look to, when somebody needs grapes picked, we hope that we get the job, you know. Right. But uh, years later, at some film festival or something, I was on some panel. Uh, they were showing it again, and I saw it again with good projection after really 20 or 30 years, how long it was. This was only three or four years ago. And I suddenly realized that I'd been completely wrong, and that, in fact, it was a marvelous movie, and that it is hideously, hideously sad, almost, you know, weepingly sad. And that I was, I had been wrong. I hadn't, mm-hmm. I'd been young and foolish, and I didn't understand that the things we do in life never go away, and that they're mm-hmm. always accumulating in our, in our minds and in our history. And I simply didn't get it. Mm-hmm. And I had been wrong, and, that, and, and Marty had been right, and it was a marvelous movie. And at the time, I didn't quite think that. You know, mm-hmm. that's stupid of me. <laughs> well, anyway. before, before I let you go, I want to ask you about one, one, of, one of your more recent credits, and it's one of my favorite films. It was my favorite, one of my favorite films growing up uh, uh, as a teenager in the 90s, and that's uh, The Fugitive. Uh-huh. Um, oh, that, well, like, um, that again is... Uh, uh, somewhat complicated story. I didn't start out the fugitive. They'd shot for about a week. Mm-hmm. Uh, Andy Davis was the director, and the cameraman was a Brit whose name I can't remember, who was a perfectly good cameraman. Uh, but uh, Harrison was not happy, and the studio was not happy. And after I, either a week or a week and a half, they fired the cameraman. I don't want to mm-hmm. get into the I don't want to get right. into the specifics of this because, in fact, it's more complicated than that. But I don't want to be gossipy and bitchy, so I won't. I'd okay. like not to do it. That's but fine. so they called me up. And they said, don't you want to do this movie? And I, the last thing in the world I wanted to do was to go to Chicago in the middle of the winter and freeze. It had already shot in Chicago in the winter, and it's really not fun. And so I quoted a 
huge price because I knew that, that I didn't want to insult Warner Brothers because I did a lot of work for Warner Brothers. But I, I was trying to get out of it, so I quoted a, a you know ridiculous price, and of course they accepted it, and I was off <laughs> to Chicago in the middle of the winter to freeze. Um, it was you know uh, it had one great advantage, and that was that the the lead was Harrison Ford, and Harrison Ford of all the actors and actresses and movie stars that you run into, he is the class act of the whole bunch. No really? question about it. Oh. He is the good. He is one of the good guys, mm-hmm. and that was the first movie I worked with him on. I worked with him later on another one, um, and and that six was six days, seven nights. Six, six days, seven nights, right? With yeah. Anne Hayes, uh, and that was a great uh, a gift that he was because it was it was a very difficult movie for a lot of reasons that I don't want to go into. It was a very very difficult movie right. to do, and uh, thank God for Harrison because he is mm. one of he is really a, one of the he's a real trooper, one of the good guys. Mm. So uh, it was good for that, and and uh, you know it, it's a it's it's a good movie. I yeah. I'm very proud of it in the end, uh, for all of its the struggles involved in that were struggles. Wow, uh, but you know again it's it's a good movie. I'm glad I did it. And then when you're finished, you're all you think God, I get another movie. I got to support my family. <laughs> what movie can I get? So I you know went on to something else. But I'm glad you liked it. Did you see Did you see the the last movie I did, Bridge to Terabithia? That is one I'm actually quite proud of. Yes. Oh, it's a terrific. Uh, I mean, Bricks of Terabithia is one of my favorite books uh, growing up. So yeah, I didn't read. I'm too old. I didn't read it, but apparently it's a classic for children of a certain age. It is, it is classic, and there had been a a TV movie adaptation, I guess, in the 70s when you oh, know really? when they would. And um, I remember they showed it to us after they read the book in class, and they showed us the film, and and it was one of those weird things, you know, when you. You know, you've just finished the book, and so now you're going to see this film, and so all the, you know, we're all excited. We're going to see this film, and of course, they go and do, do all these changes and all this stuff. Yeah. So a lot of the kids started moaning and groaning. Uh, so when I saw that this was going to be a full scale production, I was so happy because it's finally going to get the treatment it deserved. No, it's a, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful film and a wonderful piece of camera work. It's just terrific. It's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a very nice film. I also, I often think that in, in a way, it's a, it's a movie about children, but almost not. It's almost for adults. Adults, uh, mm. adults weep. Yeah. Uh, you know, when it gets grim at the end. Uh, mm. We saw a screening of it just before it came out, and my wife was in the at the end after the movie. My wife was in the ladies' john, and she came out and said, "You know, there were women; and they were crying their eyes out." No, it's a, it's a heartbreaker. It's yeah, it really. Is. It's, it's, and, I, I I'm very I'm actually very proud of it. Um, and uh, before I let you go, what is what is next uh, on your plate? Is there anything new? Oh. I, I, um, uh, Bridge to Terabithy was the last movie I ever shot. I've retired. I'm fully retired. You're fully I'm, retired? Oh, uh, yeah. It would take a gun to my head to make me shoot another <laughs> movie. I can't do the hours anymore. It's too. It's, the hours are too. I'm, you know, I'm an old man, and the hours are too brutal. Well, that's you, part you, of why I did uh, <clears throat> Bridge to Terabithia. I had done, a, I'd done, I think, three children's movies in a row because the hours in children's movies, because of the labor laws of the state of California, the hours are, are just not as brutal. Mm-hmm. And I was able to do it. You know, that's oh, you, why. You went out. On, you went out on a good one, sir. And oh, I, I think I did. That was part of why I figured I quit. I might as well quit on an up note. <laughs> well, uh, Mr. Chapman, I want to thank you uh, for joining us and telling us all these stories. Uh, whenever uh, another one of your films comes out on Blu-ray, please come back and we'll talk. We'll talk <laughs> some more. All right. I okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. That was cinematographer Michael Chapman talking about. All of us, a lot of us films on his resume, but in particular, we're talking about Raging Bull, which is now out on Blu-ray. Our next guest has been waiting, uh, so let's get to that. Our next, our next guest is able to provide a different, more intimate perspective on the story of Jake LaMotta. He's also a noted filmmaker in his own right. Growing up on the same mean streets as Scorsese, William Lustig has specialized in the so-called disreputable disreputable genre of exploitation cinema. He made his directorial debut with The Notorious Maniac, a slasher film epic that has not lost any of its power to shock or haunt, and contains a -a one-of-a-kind performance by the late Joe Spinell. He followed that up with the equally exciting Vigilante with Robert Forster and Fred Williamson. His other credits include the cult classic Maniac Cop with Bruce Campbell, Tom Atkins, and William Smith, the sleazy serial killer thriller Relentless, 
and the patriotic horror thriller Uncle Sam. Since 2002, Lustig has been the CEO of Blue Underground, a DVD outfit that provides criterion collection level treatment for exploitation films, foreign and domestic. Joining us to discuss his memories of his famous Uncle Jake LaMotta and the making of Raging Bull, it is my pleasure to welcome filmmaker William Lustig to Back by Midnight. That's got to be the most incredible introduction I've ever had. <laughs> well, I, uh, I mean every word of it, uh, so it's, uh, it's great, to, great to have you on the show. I, I guess you heard a little the tail end of Michael Chapman there. My God, yeah, it was really interesting. I mean, uh, he's what a great guy, what a great cameraman. I'm I'm sorry he's retired. Yeah. I mean, so, I, I assumed you guys talked about Taxi Driver before I came yeah, on. Taxi Driver a little. I asked him. Um, uh, I go. I asked him. Uh, I go. Taxi Driver. You know, with all the 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 the, the steam, the rain, the filth, the scum that Travis uh, sees. Uh, I go. I was wondering. How much of that was just, you know, catching it as it was on the streets versus, you know, uh, heightening heightening it for, for the camera? And, you know, how much of it was practical? How much of it was set dressing? And he was like, well, back then, he goes, that, well, in Taxi Driver, that was probably about 50-50. Uh, half of it, you know, half of it was already there. We didn't need to do anything. The other half, we just made it look a little uglier. Uh, so <laughs> uh, now now it would probably be 100% if you wanted to recreate that look. Uh, oh, yeah since the place has cleaned up a little. But uh, let me let me ask you this. What is your earliest memory of your Uncle Jake? Well, my earliest memory is when I lived in the Bronx, and um, he used to come by our apartment. And um, he, <laughs> he used to uh, uh, teach uh, uh, my, uh, you know, the, my, uh, my uh, cousins and myself uh, boxing. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know we were very young, and he used to like you know show us the moves about you know defense moves and 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 uh, and and how to punch and and the thing about it was uh, he used to smack us if we left our defenses down. <laughs> so here we were, little kids being smacked by a middleweight champion, <laughs> and God forbid we cried, he would he would call us all sissies and you know humiliate us and <laughs> torment us. And uh, that was uh, that was one of my memories of Uncle Jake. Um, uh, you know, we, he used to come around quite often, uh, and uh, um, he used to. One of the things he used to do to the children too is he used to stick his uh, two of his fingers in the roof of the mouth and lift us hmm. in the air from the roof of our mouths. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That was uh, that was his thing. He was in. He was in great shape when I was a, you know, when I was a young kid in the Bronx, and yeah. it was only later that he, you know, he started when he, you know, after a while of uh, retirement from boxing that he started to, you know, put on some weight and, but he's still in great shape, you know. Right. He really is. Well, let me let me ask. I, I guess maybe for our listeners, we can um, uh, maybe you can explain this. How, how does the, the the family tree work? How is Jake Lamada your uncle? My, my mother, uh, my mother is his sister. Okay. My mother Maria is his youngest sister. Okay. All right. And so, growing up, so this was Uncle Jake, and he would come mm-hmm. and, and do these boxing things with the kids and all this. When did, uh, from that, from that perspective, when did you realize that, oh, Uncle Jake, yeah, he was also this person before I was born. This this middleweight champion and so forth. When did you... Well, I was born in 55, and he was still quite famous, mm-hmm. um, in our, especially in the neighborhood. I was in the Bronx, and, mm-hmm. you know, Jake was, a, Uncle Jake was, a, you know, was a, was a major celebrity over there. I mean, he, everybody mm-hmm. knew him. It, it, there was some cachet to being his nephew. And, I assume uh, you weren't picked on much? Uh, um, no, I don't recall, but I don't think it was because of my Uncle Jake. It was just uh, I don't recall being picked on very much over there. Um, and uh, he, um, yeah, he really, you know, he was he 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 still had a you know great deal of celebrity, and uh, and uh, you know well, we were known in the neighborhood. You know, it was a it was it was it was interesting. You know, because I, I grew up with you know with him being um, treated like royalty everywhere he went. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
if you just joined us, we're talking to William Lustig, who is the nephew of Jake LaMotta, and we're talking about Jake LaMotta in conjunction with the Blu-ray debut of Raging Bull. And so when did the uh, the book came out? Um, I think it was... It was in the... Uh, it was like in the uh, late 60s, 67, I think, 68. And so what was that process? Of, what, what do you remember? Uh, I guess you're about well, 13, 14 of, okay, I'm going to tell my story up to this point. Uh, for well, uh, what it was is uh, Pete Savage, who was, uh, who was uh, 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 you know, a, a, like my uncle's best friend, mm-hmm. um, his real name, Peter Petrilla, um, he believed in Jake. He was like, he, he, when Jake was so down in the dumps in the 60s, Jake really hit rock bottom in the 60s. He was broke. He was scrambling around trying to earn a living any way he could. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there was a time he was picking up garbage in Central Park. I mean, here's a guy who was middleweight champ picking up garbage to feed his family. It was really quite pathetic. And uh, Pete was always there to kind of help him out. And uh, and Pete said to him one day, um, you know, I really think your you know your story would make a you know great movie. So um, there was a guy Joseph Carter who uh, wrote the book. And it was basically, it was a very fictionalized version of of Jake's life. It really wasn't very true. It was, it read almost like a Warner Brothers gangster movie. Mm-hmm. You know, like it was the criminals with the heart of gold kind of thing. You know, uh, the James Cagney and Angels with Dirty Faces type of type of uh, approach. Mm-hmm. And. Um, and but Pete was very persistent and um and saw a movie called Mean Streets. Hmm. And when he saw Mean Streets, um he uh you know, he sent the book to uh to Robert De Niro and Martin Scorsese. And uh and De Niro I actually it went to De Niro first. It went to De Niro and uh and then De Niro just loved the character. He didn't like the book. But he liked the character. He thought the character was interesting. He thought mm-hmm. Jake's Jake's character was interesting. So it was uh, De Niro who um, interested uh, Martin Scorsese, who was also going through a difficult period. They had just done, uh, I think it was New York, New York. Right. No, it, it was before New York, New York. It was around Taxi Driver. Mm-hmm. Taxi Driver was after, no, it was before New York, New York. Taxi Driver, 76, New York, New York is uh, 77. Right, okay. But it was some, it was, there was a film, I think, that Scorsese had done before Taxi Driver. Alice doesn't to... live here anymore. Is, uh, yeah. The other one. Before I that. think it was, I think, that, you know, Scorsese was interested. Mm-hmm. Uh, during Taxi Driver, he was interested. But then he was committed to doing New York, New York, and uh, and I think De Niro was committed to doing Godfather too. I may be confusing it. Nin- right Nineteen hundred, I think, was his. Nineteen hundred. That was the picture. Right. Right. Nineteen hundred. Ah, now I remember it uh, clearly. What happened was after he finished Nineteen Hundred, um, is when he committed to doing uh, Raging Bull and started to hang out with my uncle Jake and and was trained by my uncle Jake while he was uh, doing the dubbing on 1900. Because I remember this. They used to meet at my office, which was on Broadway and 49th Street. And, and it, I remember it was during the winter, and De Niro was wearing a winter coat, and he had a cassette recorder in the pocket. And when Jake would start talking, um, De Niro would be recording everything that Jake would say. Mm-hmm. And then they would go down to 14th Street. It was Gleason's Gym. And that's where uh, uh, um, my Uncle Jake started training, you know, De Niro. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, uh, and, and, I, and I must tell you that the movie is, is really dead-on accurate. It's, mm-hmm. uh, the, the, the book was kind of a, was, was kind of a um, it, it, you know, was, a, was kind of a work of fiction, but, but the movie is very, very accurate. Mm-hmm. So they basically... Um, you know, used the stories of my uncle Jake, and uh, and that's how they created the screenplay. I mean, it was really they went back to the book. Really, had very little basis for the movie. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, let me ask you this: I know Scorsese was the, the stories have have always been that Scorsese was kind of 
half interested and he would not get interested. And then at one point, the, the hook for him was the relationship of Jake with his brother. And mm-hmm. that was kind of the, that's something that he could hook on to. And I'm curious, what what do you think about, what is it about that relationship that you think was able to kind of be an emotional hook, not only for Scorsese, but it winds up being an emotional hook for the the whole audience because even if you're an only child you can that bond of older brother younger brother is universal you you witnessed it or you're part of it or so forth yeah well it was um firstly my uncle joe uh hated the idea of of joe pesci playing him um i don't i don't want to you know he used to call him the uh effing uh midget (laughs) <laughs> that was my uncle Joe's. Uh, that was my uncle Joe's take on on uh, on Joe Pesci. Mm-hmm. I mean, he met with Joe Pesci. He taught, you know, he spent some time with Joe Pesci, but really hated the idea that he was being depicted as this short guy. That, that's all that stuck in my uncle Joe's mind. Mm-hmm. And uh, as a result, he kind of made himself persona non grata for the movie. After he, after a little while, he was sort of uh, banned from the movie. <laughs> But, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that really was, you know, it, it really was what made, I think, that film, you know, resonate with people was because of that, that relationship. But I also think, you know, the self-destructive nature of, of my Uncle Jake is, in, is really in a lot of people. And a lot of us realize that we could very well be, you know, uh, you know, Jake Lombarda, you know, that, that, that we're, that, you know. But for the grace of God, we're not. Right. But his impulses that he acted on are very much the impulses a lot of people think about. Mm-hmm. He just would act on it. Right. Um, because join us, we're talking to filmmaker William Lustig, a uh, nephew of Jake LaMotta and a filmmaker in his own right. Uh, we're talking on the occasion of the Blu-ray debut of Raging Bull. Well, let me ask you about a couple of, I guess, uh, scenes in the film, and you can tell me, you know, if it's a combination or a mm-hmm. fictional or whatever. And I guess the big centerpiece scene in the film is the fight between Jake and Joey that kind of rips the family apart, I guess, for a while. It, it yeah, but that, that never really happened. Mm-hmm. It's, it, it's really, um, you know, it, that, that was an embellishment mm-hmm. on, on the the whole thing about my uncle Joe and you know the idea that you know my uncle Jake was jealous that he would be you know fooling around with his wife and all that that that's really you know there might have been some of those thoughts but it never really that, that whole fight scene of going you know that just never happened mm-hmm. to the best of my knowledge I've never heard of it I would have heard of it had it happened right right and and then I guess the, the... but Jake was extremely jealous of 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 Vicky, mm-hmm. and he used to, you know, I remember, uh, I mean, I, it's horrible, but I remember Vicky coming to our apartment, and I'll never forget this, and uh, she was standing, my grandmother lived with us, but that's uh, my Uncle Jake's mother lived with us, and mm-hmm. she came to see my grandmother, and I came into the kitchen, and she had her uh, blouse off, and she was in a bra, and she was all black and blue, mm-hmm. and she was showing my grandmother, you know, the beating that she had gotten. Mm-hmm. For my uncle Jake, so right. that aspect of the film is extremely accurate. Mm-hmm. Well, and then I guess the, the and then the final portion, the portion of uh, as I said earlier in the show, as I introduced the film, kind of the thing of uh, Jake's fall from grace, and then his ability to kind of pick himself up in the I guess in the nightclub scene. Yes. And, and, uh, well, that actually happened. That spend an evening with Jake Lamada. The evening with Jake Lamada was that actual event. Mm-hmm. And Where I'm he curious, was. I'm curious because I know I remember at the time that the couple of critics who uh, who did not like the film they they found this quite uh, jarring that all of a sudden you know Jake is doing this evening and he's reading I guess uh, Shakespeare and a couple yeah. other things. Uh, I, yeah. Was this when when this was going on at the time? Would would was this uh, did the people in the family tell Jake you know? Maybe this is not the best route, or this is something that. Uh, oh, he uh, seriously wanted to become an actor. Mm-hmm. 
he was in, you know, did you uh, see him? You know, he was in The Hustler. Right. Um, he had done a movie in Florida called My- Miami. I think it was called Miami Expose. Mm-hmm. Um, something like that. And uh, he seriously wanted to be an actor. Mm-hmm. And he had an ama- he, he, he I think he still uh, really still does. He has an amazing memory. Mm-hmm. And so for him to do scenes from, you know, plays and do an evening like that um, was something that he was very serious about. Right. He, you know, he was in, you know, productions of, um, uh, what was that? He, oh, I remember him doing Mice and Men. Mm. Was he Lenny or George? Um, the, the Lenny. Lenny, the, oh, wow. Lenny is the retard, right? Right, right. Yeah, that's who, yeah, that's him. Okay. Yeah, well, he did that. And... Lenny. Let, let me backtrack a little real quick because I uh, we missed I, I skipped this part but I, I do want to get to it and that is that you said that training of of De Niro did with with your uncle Jake mm-hmm. and, and tell me I'm sure you you probably saw that how yes intensive was that what, what it was, was that? absolute professional training it mm-hmm. was it was it was not it was not a celebrity uh, powder puff uh, training it was. De Niro wanted to be as good a professional boxer, and and at the time, my uncle Jake seriously believed that um, at at one point, uh, you know, into the training, he really believed that De Niro had the potential to become a, pro- a professional boxer. Mm-hmm. So the training was very intense. It De Niro was totally dedicated. I mean, I. You know, I've never seen anything like it. The the dedication that De Niro had, uh, you know, was just amazing. It's mm-hmm. it's it's uh, it's it's shocking. Right. Well, and so we we'll flash forward, and so it's uh, it's 1980, December, and this has got to be, I'm sure, a very busy uh, time for the Lamada Lustig family because not only is Raging Bull out, but Maniac comes out around this. Well, time. I want to hear something funny. Both movies were mixed. The sound was mixed at the same facility. Oh, wow. So while I was working on Maniac, in the next room, Raging Bull was wor- was being uh, worked on. <laughs> and when Ma- and when Raging Bull was playing at the theaters uh, at at, uh, at the Broadway and the uh, East Side theaters, hmm. um, uh, m- 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 they were showing the trailer for Maniac. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, so that was, must have been kind of cool for you. To, to oh, sense. absolutely! It was it was it was amazing. Wow. Well, and so when your when your uncle Jake saw the film, mm-hmm. what was what do you, what was his reaction to it? Um. Well, my oh, well, firstly, my grandmother's reaction was was pr- perhaps the funniest. Uh, they had the premiere at the Sutton Theater in New York. Mm-hmm. And she came out of the theater, and the only thing, her only reaction was, Jake never cursed like that. <laughs> and it's true. Jake doesn't curse around people. When you see my Uncle Jake, he, you never hear him cursing. <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't curse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, but it wasn't like he never beat his wife. He never, you know, he never did this. He never did that. It was, I never heard him curse like that. <laughs> That was my my grandmother's take on it. Uh, my uncle my uncle Jake said you made me look too good. That was his that's his reaction to it. Um, but you know it's funny. My uncle Jake kind of looked at it from a distance. It's funny. The movie opened at a cinema in New York, two blocks from his apartment. So he used to pass the cinema all the time and see the people going to see a movie about his life. Mm-hmm. So he thought because it was doing. Yeah, very good business in New York that the movie was a hit. So in later years, he was getting statements from United Artists, which kept showing the film being in a negative. And my uncle had a percentage of the profits. So he kept getting the profit participation statements showing the film in a negative. And all he could think about, here was a movie that was being considered the greatest film of the decade, and you know, it, was, it was being hailed, you know. Right. And and all he could say is, how come there's no money? How come I didn't get it? How come there's no money? I saw people lined up at the theater. How come there's no profit? So that's really Jake's take on Raging Bull. I've never heard him talk about it like it's a great movie or any of those other things, you know? He really just, it was just like, you know, it happened. He never really talks about it. When uh, When you say he says you made me look too good, 
is he, uh, and that's his, you say that's kind of his stock line. Yeah. Uh, that seems yeah. to indicate, and I'm curious, is that indicating that your Uncle Jake has a self-awareness about who he Absolutely. was and, and what he was? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. My Uncle Jake is a very intelligent person. Mm-hmm. He is, um, he is not a stupid man. He's a very intelligent man. Sometimes he acts stupid, and he'll continue to do it to this day. But um, you know, he uh, you know, he also he does have a he does he does have a, a self awareness. He really does. Even mm-hmm. when even when he recently um, did something that was a kind of a throwback to a Raging Bull, um, he he immediately felt regret that he'd done it. Mm-hmm. You know, he had, he had kind of caused a scene that, that you know he could have avoided. Right. And uh, but you know his impulses are there. You know he, he <laughs> just recently my uncle I think is now eighty six, eighty seven. Right. You probably know. Right. Yeah. Uh, eighty seven, I believe. Eighty seven, right? <laughs> he just turned eighty seven uh, in July, and um, he was at an event, a boxing event, and my cousin Gary was with him. And uh, who's uh, Joe Lamada's son? And um, my uncle, is, my uncle's girlfriend, is in her fifties, and um, and he's you know he's just very jealous. And so my uncle Jake and Gary went out to grab a cigarette, and when they came back in, his his girlfriend was talking to the manager of one of the boxers, and they didn't kind of acknowledge that Jake was there. You know, they just kept on talking, and Jake kind of felt slighted and was about to punch the guy and had his hand put, you know, in a fist and was going back to, to, to land the punch on the guy, and my, uncle, my cousin had to grab his hand. <laughs> this is 87 years old. <laughs> well, next time I'm in New York, I want to take him out because he sounded like it sound like it'd be a good night on the town. Well, yeah. I'll tell you, any Wednesday night there's a restaurant in New York called uh il vagabondo and my uncle is there every wednesday night i have a standing invitation for dinner and if any of your listeners are in new york and want to stop by for an autograph he's very gladly signs things and uh he's at el vagabondo which i think is on 60 i want to say 62nd or 64th street and uh yeah he's there every wednesday night well, uh, before I let you go, I want to ask you a, a, a question about you real quick, and that you're, you've now transplanted to California. Well, uh, actually, I still have a residence in New York, and I have residence in New York and L.A. L.A., but, but I'm curious, what, what's it like, or what is your take on it? Uh, how do you feel about the New York of today? Because you, you have, I, 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 you know, there's been, st- you know, you hear statements from, the directors who, some mm-hmm. filmmakers who came up in the 70s and 80s, guys like Abel Ferrara and all these who, who you know, they, they can't film there anymore. It, you know, it's too clean or and it's not what it used to be. It, well, well it's funny because or? it's funny because where I live in New York is the East Village, mm-hmm. and it's still the uh, the New York City um, uh, location for all the, for it's the, it's the last remaining gritty location <laughs> In New York, uh, the Lower East Side in the East Village, mm-hmm. um, that's where they shoot Life on Mars and uh, um, any of the t- any time they want to depict the New York, uh, you know, the kind of seventies New York, they they shoot in the East Village. Right. But yeah, it's true. I mean, Times Square has been Disneyfied. It's 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 horrendous in my opinion. I hate it. I I can't go through there. I, I when I see the M and M store, I, I I get sick. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 really awful what's happened to Times Square. It lost all of its personality. Mm-hmm. Well, our, well, Mr. Mr. Lustig, uh, it's been great talking to you. Uh, I know I'll have you back. Uh, Blue Underground is a great label. I guess what is it? I'd love to. Where's your Where's this radio station based? Well, this is internet radio. Uh, oh, it's hosted by a website called Blog Talk Radio. So okay. anyone with a computer can hear it, and then it's archived, and then um, it's also available for free downloads on iTunes. Really? Uh, yeah. So it's uh, it's worldwide. So anyone oh, wow. can, will come midnight. Anyone will be able to listen to this on the archives and on iTunes, uh, and Great. Then you can post it anywhere. 
And I, like I said, I know I'll have you back. Blue Underground, I guess it's going on its uh, seventh year and uh, doing. Yeah, actually, yeah, we made it to uh, year seven. It's year amazing. Seven. And uh, you're, y'all are finally, I guess y'all were sitting out the format wars to see which one was going to win out. And yeah, uh, I was saying I was very close to that. I, um, I, I was, I'm really one of the first independents to get into Blu-ray. I'm, I'm, I, I've released three, and I have another. Um, I'm going to be releasing about 10 Blu-rays this year. Wow. And uh, maybe more. I'm not mm-hmm. sure. But uh, I'm, well, what, I'm really what, gung-ho about Blu-ray. What's, uh, well, I'll ask, uh, you can do a little plug here. What, what's what's the, the next one on, on, on the calendar uh, for Blu-ray? Well, we just released Dead and Buried. Mm-hmm. Uh, and next up is Bird with the Crystal Plumage, Dario Argento's first uh, movie. Mm-hmm. With the uh, director of photography was uh, Vittorio Storaro. Wow. And he supervised the high definition transfer of the film from its original camera negative, so it looks absolutely gorgeous. Mm. After that is Two Evil Eyes. Uh, that's the uh, Romero Argento collaboration. Right. And then we have uh, Fast Company, directed by David Cronenberg. Correct. Right. And Circle of Iron, the famous uh, Bruce Lee uh, story, uh, starring um, uh, David Carradine. Mm-hmm. So we have a lot of exciting things coming out on Blu-ray. And um, next year will be the 30th anniversary of uh, of Maniac. Uh, I, I assume we'll we'll be seeing we're, that. exactly. We're going to do a 30th anniversary uh, Blu-ray. Well, before I, before I let you go, uh, and you'll repeat it when I have you back on for Maniac. But can you tell me uh, a Joe Spinell story? Oh God, <laughs> there's so many. I'll tell you a story that's related to, to uh, Michael Chapman. I was on the set uh, the night that they shot the scene in Taxi Driver where uh, De Niro is in front of that cafeteria with uh, Peter Boyle. Right. And they're doing that scene on the street, and, uh, you know, and they're talking about, uh, you know, he's talking about his anxieties and stuff, and Peter Boyle's trying to kind of talk him down a little bit. Right. Anyway, that was, I was there with Spinell that night. Oh, right. Um, but uh, there's so many great Spinell stories. One of the one of the things that one of the, the the highlights of the Maniac DVD, and and it will be carried over to the Blu-ray is we did an hour documentary about Joe Spinell, mm-hmm. where people told you know where we told basically all the stories, um, most of the stories, uh, the most of the famous stories about Joe Spinell. I mean, he was just uh, he was an amazing man. I I, I miss him dearly. Right. Well, Mr. Lustig, like I said, please uh, thank you. Call me Bill, <laughs> would you? <laughs> okay, Bill. Oh, well, thank you for taking the time out. It's been great talking to you. And like I said, I will have you back soon. It's my pleasure, and thank you.